Welcome to this new lecture on uh, hybrid force motion control. We have uh, seen that um, there are two conditions under which we uh, model and control the interaction between a robot and the environment. The first uh, involves compliance at the contact and leads to the design of impedance control. The second uh, assumes that the environment is infinitely stiff and uh, uh, constrains the motion in some uh, direction. So, uh, in this lecture for hybrid force motion control design, we will uh, uh, consider this second situation. When the robot is in contact with a very stiff environment, so infinitely rigid in principle, maintains contact so that there are uh, natural constraints acting on the end effector motion, which may be considered as bilateral one. So we cannot penetrate the environment with the end effector of the robot, but also we don't want to lose contact because otherwise we would uh, fall in a different category of uh, control tasks. Now, uh, we have already seen that there's a possibility of uh, uh, considering such bilateral geometric constraints uh, within the dynamics and obtain a constrained uh, dynamic model or a reduced dynamic model where we eliminate the extra degrees of freedom uh, and remain only with the independent uh, degrees that allows motion. So what is, what is new in this context? There are some differences uh, when we are dealing with hybrid force motion control. I just uh, remind you that um, we have seen, for instance, in the uh, modeling uh, using the re reduced approach, where we um, eliminate uh, the M, uh, M of the generalized coordinates uh, um, associated to the constraints, so we have a reduced dynamics of N minus M uh, differential order. Uh, so, in that case, we have also designed, we have seen that that approach is uh, suitable for designing a feedback linearization and decoupling approach so that you can control in an independent way through simple integration or even no integration both the uh, constraint forces that arise when you attempt to violate the geometric constraints and uh, the free motion. Now, what are the differences at this stage? First of all, uh, we still design the hybrid control law uh, imagining we are in ideal condition. We will see what this uh, in particular means. But now the uh, direction where we have constrained forces and unconstrained motion uh, will be defined using a, a special formula which uh, involves a task frame, a usual frame that is associated to the task. So it will be more direct uh, to visualize. The second, and more important, is that we will consider non-ideal condition. So we will apply the control law of design in this way, but that takes care of the fact that the surfaces are not infinitely stiff, so they are not rigid, there could be some compliance at the contact, and this compliance may be originated not only by the environment, but also from the contact type, the presence of a, a force or a force torque sensor, and, and so on. Moreover, uh, while in geometric setting you don't consider friction at the contact, so while you're moving in contact, there's no force uh, dissipating energy. Uh, we will also have uh, take into account this uh, to understand the performance of the hybrid force motion controller. And last but not least, uh, indeed, if we have some geometric uncertainty, so if there is error in the orientation, for instance, of the surface at the contact where the robot is making contact with the environment, uh, what will happen? So the uh, hybrid force motion control implicitly uh, includes uh, a filtering on the measured quantity, I, I would call this geometric filtering, uh, which makes sure that things uh, remain consistent with respect to the model. So essentially, certain direction in which we don't expect that signal arise, for instance, 
in the direction where we hit the uh, surface. So we don't expect to have motion in that direction because the model assumes a, an infinitely stiff uh, environment. We may have some velocity still because of a number of reasons and we will just filter them out. And similarly, along the free direction, we don't expect any opposition to motion, but the presence of friction uh, may in fact uh, reduce the speed that we are having uh, in contact. And again, uh, we will not consider uh, forces that are being measured in that direction, which are associated, for instance, to friction. Uh, and we will just treat those extra components, uh, if of course they are not too large, as disturbances to be rejected by the control design. So, in, in a sense, uh, the hybrid control laws um, avoids that we are trying to do two things at the same time in the same direction, namely controlling forces and controlling motion because of the measurement that we are receiving from the real system. So this is a very important point that will be clear later on. So with this in mind, uh, in the literature uh, there has been uh, a consideration of two types of constraints. Uh, this may be misleading because, in fact, the second type of constraints is not really constraining at all, but this terminology now is uh, in use. So, first of all, uh, we assume that there are ideal conditions, so both the robot, the environment and the contact are perfectly rigid, and there is no friction at the contact while the robot is moving uh, in that uh, area. So, under this condition, there are, uh, we can um, identify some generalized direction, in fact divided in two uh, complementary sets, and this direction defines the so-called task space. So you can imagine, uh, and we will see uh, a slide later on, that there is a joint space where we do actuation, the Cartesian space associated to the frame attached to the end effector, for instance through a denavit artender convention, but there's also another frame that could uh, be defined typically in the Cartesian space, but which changes accordingly to the interaction task and uh, moves along with, uh, with the operation of the task. So uh, this generalized direction, um, there are in fact uh, a total of six if we are dealing with the general um, tasks that involve position and orientation in the Cartesian space. So out of this uh, six direction, intended in a generalized sense, so uh, a direction is in fact a combination, uh, it's a six dimensional vector combining uh, uh, linear quantities and angular quantities. We will be more clear in a moment. So there are six minus k direction, along which we cannot have any motion. So no, not a linear motion, with a speed v, with a velocity v, nor an angular motion with an angular velocity omega. Why we cannot move in that direction? Because the environment will react there, uh, building re um, reaction forces uh, or torques at, at the contact so that the end effector cannot move in, in, in that set of direction. And then there are other directions where uh, the environment is not able to generate any reaction forces. Uh, this will be complementary to the previous one, so there will be k such direction, uh, so that the robot in that direction uh, is free to move, but on the other side we cannot try to apply forces in that direction because the environment will not react to these forces, and so these forces will be transformed into acceleration. There will be no uh, balance between the forces that we are trying to apply in those directions and the uh, reaction of the environment by the principle of uh, action and reaction. Now, uh, this uh, constraints that limit where we can have reaction forces or where we can uh, move have been called natural constraints on force and motion and they are associated to the task geometry, so in particular to the way in which uh, the end effector is interacting with the environment. Now, this is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 
a qualitative, qualitative description how we characterize this direction. Well, this is done through the definition of a task frame, which we call reference frame with a subscript T in general, uh, and the axis of this frame will specify which are this direction. So imagine that we have a generic robot, this is a cloud, uh, in contact with a generic environment represented as another cloud. So typically we place uh, a task frame uh, at the contact. If the contact change uh, in position and orientation, the task frame will move accordingly, at least uh, in the planet uh, interaction task. And along this frame we can define several, uh, the axis of this frame along and around several um, quantities, actually 12 quantities. So there are linear quantities along the x, y, and z axis. These are the component of the velocity, vx, vy, and vz, and the component of the force, fx, fy, and fz. The velocity should be intended as those of the end effector of the robot, the forces as those that the environment applies in reaction. Uh, and similarly, along, around the x and y axis, we can define uh, the three components of the angular velocity, omega x, omega y, and omega z, and the three components of the momentum, or torque, mx, my, mz, um, generated by the environment. In general, uh, the, uh, such task frame is placed at the end effector of the robot. Now, uh, with this in mind, there are also artificial constraints in this framework. Now, this artificial constraint, as I said, uh, may be misleading because they are, in fact, uh, a way in which um, some researcher, in particular Mason, uh, treated the problem of control. So, uh, we, the, in the presence of the natural constraint, we may execute our task in different modalities. So when we specify the way in which we uh, execute the task, we are in fact imposing some constraint on the total behavior. This is in fact the target of our control problem. So the way in which the free and effector velocities, linear and or angular, uh, in the k direction where feasible motion can occur are specified, and similarly how the contact forces uh, along and around the 6 minus k direction where the environment can produce reaction are being specified. So these are the reference for the uh, control. Uh, we generate error with respect to these references in uh, a number of directions which covers the whole space, so 6 minus k for contact forces and torques and k for end effective linear and angular velocities. So a total of six when the uh, Cartesian space where the robot is executing has dimension six. Of course, there will be subcases where this value of m equals six is strictly less, so for instance, planar task or something like that. So these uh, two sets of direction, as I said, are complementary, so they cover the six-dimensional generalized test space. Why six-dimensional will be clear in a moment. Uh, and they are uh, independent uh, within each set and mutually orthogonal. So when we make a, a scalar product between a six-dimensional contact force torque, which is a reaction uh, force torque of the environment, uh, with an admissible velocity, linear and angular velocity of the end effector, this product will be zero. So this uh, set of forces torques with the set of end effector velocities uh, will produce no work, in fact. Uh, moreover, the task frame can be time-bearing in the sense that uh, if we have a contact of uh, an end effector on a surface and we move the end effector on this surface accordingly if the task frame is placed at the end effector position, uh, the task frame will move. It may change orientation or not, depending on the, ge the geometry of the environment. So we say colloquially that the task frame moves uh, while the uh, task execution is in progress. 
So, uh, why 6D? Uh, because, in fact, uh, we are using, in a uh, friendly way, I would say, the mechanical concept of screws. So, screws are six-dimensional vectors, which are the stacking of either linear and angular velocity, so these are called twists in general, if you have a six-dimensional generalized velocity vector of this kind, uh, or wrenches if you stack uh, the forces, so linear quantities, and the torque, so momentum also said, um, one on top of the other. Uh, these are six-dimensional vectors, and they are called uh, in a, a unified way wrenches. So twists and wrenches are in fact particular screws and there's a mathematic of screws connected to that. But we will not, I mean, I'm mentioning this, but uh, we will not get into the decay of uh, this um, formalism, but we will see that in fact what we are doing, we are using twists and wrenches in a proper way. So, uh, let's do a few examples in order to understand how natural constraints, or also called geometric constraints, are associated to a particular interaction task, and how artificial constraints are specified accordingly, and what are the choices that we can make there. Uh, in this uh, few slides, I'm presenting three examples of increasing complexity, you will see that the robot is not there at all. In fact, we don't need to specify at this level uh, what type of robot are we doing, are we using. Uh, we assume that the robot has enough degrees of freedom to perform the task. If not, of course, some of the specification uh, of the interaction task cannot be met by control. But uh, everything deals with the way in which the end effector, and so I'm representing here uh, the end effector in this particular slide as a gripper holding an object in a firm way is interacting with uh, uh, an ideal environment. I remember, uh, I remember, I remind you that uh, the environment is uh, stiff, so infinitely rigid, or and has no friction at the contact. So it's a purely geometric one. So this is very similar to what we have seen. Uh, in the reduced or uh, constrained robot dynamics, but here we are using the concept of task frame. In fact, uh, for this task, we have a cube that should, uh, or, uh, that should slide along a guide. The guide is constraining, it, in fact, the motion. We could move up uh, the, the cube with a gripper, so a robot going up in the Z direction, but then we will lose contact so uh, we assume that we keep this type of contact all the time. Uh, we can place uh, a task frame, so a reference frame with a subscript T. In fact, the X, Y, and Z uh, axis should carry also a subscript T, but in order not to overload the notation, I just kept them as such. So, you, as you can see, uh, you immediately see if you play, I mean, how, do, how to place the frame at the contact. In fact, if I slightly rotate, for instance, this frame, which is the correct one, uh, or indeed you may replace the order of, uh, of um, axes the way you wish, but, I mean, so you can exchange uh, x with z and, then, and so on. But uh, this is the correct frame. If we imagine to rotate a little bit uh, around the z-axis this frame so that the axis, uh, axis is not, no longer aligned with the, with the guide and the y is, not, is also rotated as well, then you can imagine that uh, the free motion of sliding along the, the guide would not occur exactly in one of the axes. So uh, the choice of one axis along the guide is mandatory. And similarly, the other two axes uh, are chosen, once you have chosen x in this way, so that uh, there are pure force or motion components that can occur along each of these uh, axes. So this is the choice of the x of the task frame for this case. And let's see what are the uh, natural constraints. Uh, for a matter of uh, energy consideration and of work consideration, 
These are specified in terms of linear velocity or force and moment or force and torque. So there are 12 quantities as, as a whole and we will see that these 12 quantities, so three components for each of these four vectors, uh, belong either are constrained uh, naturally, so geometrically constrained from the interaction, or artificially constrained because we can assign to them any desired value. So let's start with the natural constraint. Uh, as you can see from the picture, uh, indeed we cannot move in the y direction with a linear motion, so vy is imposed to be equal to zero. Similarly, vz is equal to zero because we cannot go uh, against the um, bottom of the, of the guide, but as we said, uh, this becomes also a bilateral constraint because we uh, imagine not to move up the cube, so to detach one of this um, side from the bottom of the uh, guide. So vz is equal to zero as well. Similarly, uh, you really cannot move uh, around the x-axis or the z-axis because the side of the cube are in contact with the side of the guide and this will prevent any rotation around the x and z axis. On the other hand, uh, there are two natural constraints on the reaction forces that the environment can generate. Since we assume that no, there is no friction in the contact, uh, the uh, environment, so the, uh, this guide uh, uh, embracing the cube, will not be able to impose a, a reactive force along the x direction. So the x direction is in fact free, of move, free to move, um, free for motion of the, of the cube. Uh, if we try to impose a force uh, by control in that direction, uh, the cube will simply accelerate because the environment cannot balance uh, any desired force there. So we would make a mistake if we try to control force along the x direction. And similarly, uh, the cube, in fact, in this situation, uh, would be free to rotate around the y-axis. Uh, we don't want to do this because we would like to execute the task as specified, so we would like to slide, uh, and this will appear, in fact, in, uh, in the artificial constraint. But for the time being, uh, we understand that if we uh, rotate the cube trying to um, encounter uh, a momentum resisting to this motion from the environment, the environment is not able to produce any momentum, any torque around Y to contrast this type of rotation. So, as you can see, there are six quantities being specified by the natural constraint, and these are in fact four of the motion type and two of the generalized force type. Now, what are the artificial constraints? You should proceed really on a complementary way. So all the quantities that have not been involved uh, individually in the natural constraints should appear in the artificial constraints. So as a rule of thumb, if you have a linear velocity uh, along the y direction among the natural constraints, so this is constrained to be zero, and this is very important, this structural zero, then uh, the linear force along that direction, so Fy, will appear among the artificial constraint, namely to Fy, and this is the first equation that you see in the red box, can be assigned any desired value. What does it mean? Uh, that we could impose that the cube slides uh, uh, correctly along the guide while pushing against the a side of the guide along the y direction, positive or negative. So we could impose uh, through control that uh, the contact force and the reaction that the um, environment generates accordingly will be any positive or negative value of Fy of desired. Indeed, if we want to avoid internal stress, we could set this value to zero, but this zero is different from the, those above because, uh, in fact, 
uh, it's a specification. You, know, you could set any value if you want to perform in a reasonable way this uh, motion, we would set fy desired in particular equal to zero. And same story, uh, we had uh, angular quantities uh, omega x, omega z as motion constrained in the natural uh, set, uh, then uh, the associated um, torques or momentum around the x and y and z axis will appear as artificial constraint, meaning that we can assign any value mx desired or mz desired to uh, these quantities. For instance, let's look at the mz desired. What would this mean is that through controlling, uh, commanding the robot properly, uh, we could uh, try to uh, apply a momentum uh, trying to rotate the uh, cube with the gripper uh, around the z-axis, apply a momentum to the environment which would then react, no matter which momentum we are trying to apply. Uh, so mz desired could be positive or, or negative, but if we don't want to have internal stress for the cube and for the environment, we could set this reasonably equal to zero, and same story for mx. Now, uh, again, uh, we had uh, a linear velocity along uh, z in the natural constraint, so we will have a, a linear force around z uh, being specified by the artificial constraint, so as a reference for the control uh, system. So we are setting, I'm setting here a, a generic fz desired, will be positive probably, so that this guarantees that while sliding and pushing a little bit on the bottom uh, of, the, of the guide, we will guarantee that a sliding condition occurs rather than a rolling condition. And similarly, uh, we would be free to rotate the cube around the y-axis, so we can specify uh, an angular uh, uh, rotation, or angular speed, omega y desired, but since we would like to execute exactly the task by sliding the cube, we will set this value to zero. So we are free to choose any desired value, but in order to perform the task correctly, the reference should be zero angular velocity around the y-axis. And finally, uh, this is the most obvious thing, uh, we could move fast or slow, we could stop, reverse motion and so on, while uh, sliding the cube along the guide, and all this specification are embedded in a desired linear velocity vx desired along the x-axis. Now you can see that uh, we have in fact uh, out of the 12 quantities, 6 are in the artificial constraints and in particular there are k equal to uh, free motion which are being specified by the controller along the vx and uh, the linear velocity along the x-axis, so vx and the angular velocity around the y-axis, so omega y, while the remaining set, 6 minus k, so equal 4, uh, are uh, of force or momentum nature. And in a complementary way, uh, there are 6 minus k direction, so k is 2, so 4 direction, which are uh, constrained for motion of the robot and the factor and, and contact, uh, when expressed indeed in the direction uh, of uh, along and uh, around the direction of the axis of the task frame and uh, complete this there are two directions where the environment cannot generate uh, reaction force so as you can see the picture is quite uh, nice in this way but how can we use this in order to formalize things in particular we formalize uh, a way to uh, specify the generalized direction, so six-dimensional vector, that uh, where free motion can occur, and those complementary direction where uh, the environment can generate uh, reaction forces. So we will do this uh, for this example in this slide. So first of all, feasible motion. So we consider uh, the six-dimensional vector. Uh, in fact, a twist uh, of uh, stacking the three-dimensional linear velocity with the three-dimensional angular velocity. And we say that uh, all feasible motion, so 
those that comply with the uh, geometry, with the natural constraint of the environment, are those that uh, are along the x, linear x, and angular y direction. So we can write this simple relation in this case, in which we say that uh, we can consider any uh, generalized velocity for the ender factor, but those that are associated to feasible motion have only this direction. You see, uh, it's a kind of identity, so that any vector v uh, can only have the structure of 1, 0, 0, so have only a component around the x direction if uh, the motion is uh, we are considering only the feasible motion for this interaction. Uh, and similarly for the omega. So you can see that uh, these are in fact um, two columns can be organized in, in a matrix. Let's call this matrix T. Uh, this matrix has six rows always and K equal to columns which are in fact the number of free direction that we are considering. So we can parameterize any six-dimensional vector by the product of t times the two scalar vx and omega y. In a complementary way, uh, we can parameterize all feasible reactions, so the direction along which the environment is able to produce uh, forces or torques. And as we see, uh, these are uh, along the linear direction y, the linear direction z, and the uh, angular direction x and the angular direction z. So similarly, if we take a generic uh, reaction um, uh, vector, six dimensions, so in fact a range composed by the three-dimensional force F and the three-dimensional torque M, uh, then uh, this six-dimensional vector can be generated only by a combination uh, of uh, four parameters, which are the scalar Fy, Fz, and X, and Mz. Uh, so we are selecting, in fact, direction. So we will never have a force which has a component Fx as a feasible reaction force, because the first row of uh, this matrix is equal to zero, so we don't parameterize this motion, which is, in fact, no, sorry, this uh, reaction force, which is in fact not being generated by the environment in the task frame. So again, uh, you see that uh, we have elementary column of zeros and one, with the one only in one position, and we can call this matrix, which is always six-dimensional and, uh, in terms, uh, sorry, which has always six rows and has a number of columns which is equal to 6 minus k, so 4 in this case, we call this, we label this matrix Y. So, in fact, uh, this particular choice for this simple example of T and Y, uh, these are uh, constant matrices, in general they may not be constant, uh, and they uh, are in fact um, picked out of a, as columns from a 6 by 6 identity matrix. I'm using selection, uh, we are selecting and placing in the proper uh, order those uh, columns because in fact the uh, terminology of selection matrices uh, was the one that originally uh, was used within the hybrid force motion task formulas. So we'll see that this can be in fact uh, generalized and in the third example this will be very clear. Uh, but one thing that should be noticed, uh, which is very important, is uh, if you take the scalar product between the transposed columns of matrix T and the columns of matrix Y, you will get this identity. So T transpose Y is equal to zero. So the columns uh, of T are orthogonal to the columns of Y. And this is always the case in this uh, mod modeling of the interaction because in fact reveals that reaction forces and torques, so F and M <coughs> transpose uh, will <coughs> not uh, produce uh, perform work on feasible motion now this is written in the 
reverse uh, way, but it's the usual way that we do things. So forces, uh, mo momentum as a row vector, and velocity, um, angular, linear angular velocity as a column vector. Well, of course, you can transpose this and you obtain the same results. And this is what the product T transpose Y is saying. So rows by uh, linear and angular velocity and columns by uh, forces and momentum. So this is a very important relation, which should be, which guarantees that uh, we are making a consistent model, right? because reaction forces do not produce work on feasible motion. This is the concept when the contact is rigid. Of course, I should never forget the underlying assumption. Let's consider a second example, a little bit more complex, which is. Uh, in fact, sorry, just one moment, uh, which is uh, um, turning a crank. No? We have seen that this is a classical uh, example of a hybrid control problem, so where uh, forces and um, velocities are involved at the same time. So, uh, we are, in particular, we consider the case of a free handle. Yeah? So, the handle can rotate around the blue z axis, as written here. Now, I, I've put a reference frame, it could be at the base of the robot or just at the center of the crank. It's not really important here. And this is fixed. Uh, now, where should we put uh, the uh, task frame RFT? Well, uh, as we said, it's at the end of factor level and should be oriented in such a way that along each, along and around each of its axes, uh, so x, y, and z are the axes of the task frame. Again, I uh, discarded a, a subscript uh, T, which is for compactness. So uh, uh, around and along this direction, uh, either uh, you could specify something either in terms of linear angular velocity or in terms of uh, linear forces and angular uh, momentum. So the uh, one possible choice is this one with the y direction along the tangent to the circle that is being uh, traced when the crank is rotating is being turned. And you see that uh, this task frame uh, is changes in position and orientation while uh, doing the task. Uh, the previous case, of course, while the robot, while the cube was sliding, the frame was moving together with the with the, uh, with the cube, but not changing orientation at any time. Here, instead, we have also a change of orientation, which can be represented uh, with respect to the fixed zero frame by uh, an elementary rotation matrix around the z-axis, of course the z-axis, the z-zero-axis zero in this case, by an angle alpha, which progresses with the task execution. So this becomes, uh, what I said at the beginning, should become more clear now. Uh, the uh, y direction has been chosen because we know that we will have, while rotating, the tangential velocity uh, along that direction, and uh, x and z are chosen to complete the frame, but also considering that, for instance, along the x direction there will be no motion possible, okay, because we, uh, the gripper and the, therefore any robot which is behind this gripper uh, will not be able to move uh, along that direction because while firmly holding the uh, crank. Now, uh, the natural constraints uh, are the following. Again, four constraints on uh, motion quantities and two constraints on generalized forces. So we cannot really move along the x direction, so vx is equal to zero. Uh, since we are firmly ho holding the, um, the handle of the crank, we cannot move along the z direction either, so vz is equal to zero again. Remember that those zero are structural, so are not choices, are really uh, limit the motion uh, at the contact. 
Similarly, uh, we cannot rotate around the x and y axis uh, because the, um, the handle and the crank are rigid bodies, so we cannot uh, rotate in that, around that axis. Uh, but the environment, in fact, cannot oppose any forces applied along the y direction because, in fact, this is a free motion direction. And since the handle is free to rotate and there is no friction, now remember the, the assumption, the ideal assumption at the contact, also there is no momentum that the environment, so the crank, can generate uh, around the z axis. So this completes uh, the set of six natural constraints, four bars motion, and two describe the direction where the environment cannot generate reaction forces or momentum. Now, complementary to that, we will have the artificial constraints. Again, uh, the first four are on uh, completing the, the four uh, motion quantity in the natural constraint. There are four quantities of force and torques in the artificial constraint that we can assign at will. But all this value, fx desired, of z desired, and x desired, and, and y desired, will be set to zero, uh, although we could force, for instance, uh, push the handle in the x direction or pull it, but we will produce only stress. So this is um, an undesired type of contact, unless uh, we uh, would like to uh, really try to destroy this type of contact. So these values are set, could be arbitrary, positive or negative, but are set for a convenient execution of the task to zero. Now, complementary to the two quantities that are uh, among the set of natural constraints in terms of forces and momentum, we will have the possibility of specifying arbitrary values for the linear speed along the y direction, so vy desired, this is the tangent speed of rotation. If you want to rotate at one radian per second and the uh, uh, crank has a radius of uh, uh, two centimeter, uh, we will have the product of one times 0 0.02 meter per second. So 0 0.02 meter per second will be the speed along the tangent to the circle. Uh, it could be positive, stop, negative. Of course, this will uh, describe the way in which we want to rotate the crank if uniformly rotating in the same direction or um, moving in one direction, stopping, reversing, and so on. The last uh, specification for the controller, so the last artificial constraint, uh, is on omega z. In fact, omega z can take any value. Uh, if we set omega z desired to zero, it means that this handle, which is free to spin, should not spin in the way we execute the task. So while we're moving around, uh, the, there will be, let's say, one side of the handle which will always uh, be exposed toward the center of the crank. This means omega z uh, equal to zero. Indeed, uh, because it, it will move together with uh, the frame the task frame. Instead, if we would like to keep the uh, orientation of, uh, let's say, the angle around Z of the uh, free handle constant with respect to the zero frame, indeed, we should specify an omega Z which is associated to uh, this type of uh, behavior. So these are uh, all the right-hand value, side values of this artificial constraint can be specified in general at will and will be um, associated to a different way of executing the task. Now, uh, even in this second example, we can parameterize the uh, direction of free motion and parameterize as well uh, the direction where the environment is producing uh, reaction forces or torques. Uh, we will use again the formulas with the T and Y matrices, but now we will have a slight uh, change because we are in fact having a task frame which is rotating with the angle alpha. 
So if we write things in the uh, zero frame, so in the absolute frame, so a linear velocity and an angular velocity as expressed in this frame, uh, we will have that the selection uh, is being made in the task frame, so uh, we can only have a linear velocity along the y direction and angular velocity around the z direction, so you can see the second matrix with zeros and one, uh, and uh, multiplying the two parameters v y and omega z, which, as, as I said, parameterize the only feasible motion at the contact. But in fact, if we are writing these quantities in the zero frame, we need to rotate the associated velocities by uh, the R uh, alpha matrix transpose. In fact, we are. Uh, this is the orientation, R is the orientation matrix of the uh, reference, task reference frame. Uh, so when we are expressing quantities from that frame in the zero frame, we should use the transpose of this rotation matrix. And of course, there's a rotation for the linear velocities and a rotation for the angular velocities. So if we combine these two matrices, one with the two rotations and the columns of constant column of 0, 1, we obtain uh, a matrix T, which is a function of alpha, so it changes with uh, the execution of the task. Now, uh, complementary uh, to that, uh, we will have also the generalized uh, forces and torques that the reaction, that the environment can produce as reaction. So again, if we are writing things in the uh, zero frame, we will have uh, first um, selecting columns from the identity matrix with ones and zero that specified which are the direction along which we can have reaction forces or around which we can have reaction torques, so Fx, Fz, Mx, and Fy. And then uh, this uh, reaction range uh, should be expressed in the zero frame and so should be rotated by the same quantity. So uh, the resulting y matrix, uh, the product of the two matrices in the, this second formula, will be also a function of alpha. But no matter how, uh, this property still holds. You know, when you do the transposition of the rotation matrix in T of alpha uh, will um, not carry uh, the transpose and we multiply directly the transpose matrix in the uh, range so this will be eliminated and what matters in fact is only the uh, orthogonality of the zero one columns of t uh, trans which becomes uh, in fact rows of t transpose and the zero one columns of the matrix y Okay, the last example uh, is the more sophisticated that I will present, of course, many more can be considered, which shows that uh, we really need to work with screws with six-dimensional uh, vector. And um, to understand also the terminology of screw, let's consider a task where we are really inserting a, a physical real screw into a bolt. Now, you know that there are um, several standards for, uh, building, for, for building screws so that you can use them uh, all over the world. Uh, and one of these parameters is the so-called screw pitch. So it's the distance between one spiral and the next one uh, along the screw. For instance, uh, 0 0.5 millimeters, of course, you can use uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, units in this case many times. So again, uh, there's no robot here, there's only a gripper holding the uh, screw from the top, and we are already imagining that we have started the insertion so that the type of uh, contacts and interaction uh, can be characterized by a reference frame, which is the red one now, uh, with the z-axis pointing downward or upward would be exactly the same. So it's still a, a right-handed reference frame. Now, when we're doing this, uh, we understand, uh, just before introducing 
the equation or the natural and the artificial constraint, we understand that while we are progressing with the task, so the screw is being inserted in the bolt, it cannot keep the same orientation. So the linear speed at which we progress inserting the, the, the bolt, the screw in the bolt, will be associated to an angular velocity as well because of the existence of the uh, screw pitch. Now, it would be different if we were inserting, let's say, a, a cylinder, so a peg in a hole, uh, which has not uh, this ball type uh, spirals. Uh, so in this case, we could progress by inserting with a certain speed uh, while keeping the orientation or while uh, specifying also uh, an angular speed along the z-axis. So the situation is completely different in this case. In fact, if we start with the natural constraint, we can write so, uh, those that are clear. For instance, that we cannot have a motion along the x-axis, neither along the y-axis, which are normal to the insertion direction of the screw in the bolt. So these four quantities are zero. Indeed, there are two missing quantities here uh, to be completed. Okay. Uh, what about the artificial constraint? Uh, since the previous one were partial, these at this stage are abundant in the sense that there are some relationship among those quantities. And in fact, um, assuming again, this is very important at this stage, that there is no friction at the contact, so um, the bolt is not feeling any friction, which is counterintuitive because we know that in order to screw or sometimes unscrew uh, um, the screw in a bolt uh, we may uh, need to apply uh, a force exactly in those directions but uh, since this is a geometric model let's see what this specified so um, indeed we can push the screw on the side of the of the bolt uh, in x direction and y direction and again uh, try to uh, rotate the bolt around the x and y axis but this will not be possible because there will be a reaction forces and a momentum that will oppose this type of motion if we want to achieve a perfectly tuned uh, insertion we could set this value to zero then we can set uh, an arbitrary positive velocity VCD desired that uh, associate the progress uh, of the uh, insertion, the speed uh, is insertion, and accordingly uh, we will have uh, an angular speed. Uh, and this angular speed is in fact specified by the speed, the linear speed at which we are progressing. In fact, the relation is very simple. Uh, the omega z desired cannot be chosen other than uh, as vz desired multiplied by 2 pi over p which means if you have a, a pitch of 0, 0,1 millimeter and you're progressing at 1 millimeter per second or 0, 0,1 millimeter per second then p and vz will simplify and uh, in one second you will, you will have done a full rotation of the screw. So this is the reason of this simple formula. So you can, uh, this, this is the problem at this stage. So on one side you can specify Vz desired, but then you will have automatically a free omega z which is being specified accordingly, or vice versa you can specify a desired angular uh, velocity around the z-axis and automatically you will, have, you will specify uh, a, pro, um, a linear velocity um, for the progression of the task. So this is quite obvious. So there's something that should be eliminated here and in fact uh, should be parameterized in a different way. Uh, the artificial constraints are completed. Uh, of course we can um, have um, um, Uh, we can apply, sorry, just one moment. 
So we can apply uh, a force along the z-axis and uh, this is in fact uh, true because we have the side of the, uh, of the uh, bolt inside that opposes uh, forces. Uh, but accordingly, we will have also a momentum, and this momentum will be a function of uh, Fz design. So this is uh, critical, and here we could uh, be lost if we would like to uh, express directly this relationship. But we will see that the formalism of feasible motion and uh, feasible reaction forces will help us uh, immediately. So the, pro the problem here is the following. So this is not a complete description. It's not a correct description, this description because uh, we can proceed along, or the screw can proceed along and around the z-axis, but indeed uh, these two motions are not independent. And in fact, there's only one degree of freedom that should be parameterized. And similarly, uh, this type of uh, linear forces and momentum around the, uh, along and around the z-axis cannot be independent either. So, uh, the idea is that we should remember that uh, the range direction of the uh, reaction um, forces and momentum should be orthogonal to the feasible motion twists, so linear and angular velocity, and this will help in understanding how to select uh, direction or quantities. In fact, in this case we will not select uh, direction as columns uh, of the uh, identity matrix, 6 by 6 identity matrix, but we will need to combine linear and angular quantities as uh, intuition says. So, uh, how do we do this? Now, in order to have more space in the slide, I've written uh, the column of T as uh, a row transpose, to be transposed. So, all uh, linear and angular feasible velocities, so the parameterization, are parameterized just by one quantity. We can choose which one to use, either Vz or omega z. In this case, I've chosen Vz. And in fact, there's only one degree of freedom which is allowed for motion. And this motion will be a combination of a linear and angular uh, progress. So, in fact, the twist, so a, 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 a rotor translation around and along the z axis. So, this can be parameterized in this way. So, all feasible v omega uh, are specified by vz and occur uh, in the x, in the z direction of the linear in motion and in the z, uh, around the z direction for the angular motion with a special factor which is exactly the factor that uh, relates vz to omega z. Of course we could have put a 1 in the last element of this vector and accordingly we would have uh, put, so we would have parameterized things with omega z and accordingly we would have had uh, a p over 2 pi uh, in the third component. So this is uh, your choice. Now, uh, how do we uh, complete the five direction around which uh, the environment can react? You know, remember that uh, the sum of the free motion direction and the, of the uh, reaction direction should make sum up to 6. So we will do this by uh, looking for uh, the maximum uh, the, the, the matrix which the maximum number of independent columns, namely five, that lies in the null space of the T transpose of this row vector that you see on top of the slide. So it's, this is very uh, convenient because it's very easy to compute that. You can do it also in MATLAB. And this is the solution. So, uh, where are the zeros? You will put the one so that you have a direction which is certainly in the null space. So, uh, the first column of the y matrix uh, contains a one in position one associated to the zero in position one of the T transpose uh, vector. Uh, the second one will be in position one, and similarly, another one in position four. Uh, sorry, so second one will be in position 2, 
uh, and then uh, again a one in position four and position five, so that these uh, produce certainly zero. And finally, uh, an orthogonal vector to the 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2 pi over p, which is, for instance, the one with the minus 2 pi over p in the third position and the one in the last position. So again, uh, we have this matrix it has clearly uh, independent columns, so it's our y matrix, and all um, forces and momentum here. Uh, forgot to change the notation into a, a, a small letters instead of capital letters, sorry for that. I will correct this on the slides. So Fx, Fy, and Mx, Ny, and Z uh, are parameterizing uh, the five-dimensional space of reaction ranges. Uh, and uh, you see that um, from that column, that, that row, that uh, the uh, forces uh, along the, the reaction forces along the z direction is a factor minus 2 pi over p of the momentum. So this is the way in which you can uh, relate things. Of course, uh, you may have used also the fz to parameterize that, but then the matrix so mz would be a function of uh, fc uh, from the same formula. And you can uh, use fc in place of mz to parameterize the task. In any case, you can see that the columns of t and y uh, do not necessarily uh, are selection of the columns of the identity matrix. In fact, they are generalized crew direction in the six-dimensional space. So I think that uh, this last uh, example uh, specified better what's going on. So now we move from this example to the general formulas. Before doing that, we uh, need to um, focus on uh, uh, an application issue, namely what are the frames of interest involved in this hybrid uh, task. So, Consider, for example, a planar case. So now we are uh, living in a, a m equal to dimensional space, uh, in, in the Cartesian space, and we have a contact, a point contact on an environment surface of a generic form. Now, where are the tasks of interest here? Where are the quantities? Where are the quantities being uh, measured? In particular, the green uh, block on the end effector represents a force torque sensor, which is now measuring only forces uh, in the um, plane of motion. The contact is pointwise, so there could not be any momentum associated with that. Um, although, indeed, uh, there is a momentum uh, if you apply a force at the tip uh, and if you're using the frame associated to the uh, Force torque uh, to the sorry to the force torque sensor. Yes, uh, you will uh, experience also momentum around the z-axis, but in fact we will uh, use a frame which is uh, a different one. So first of all, the task frame. The task frame. Uh, okay, here here they are. Uh, the task frame uh, is. Uh, has is the red one with the one axis uh, aligned with the tangent and uh, another axis along the normal to the surface. Indeed, uh, along the xt direction we will be able to uh, control motion, so it's a free motion direction. Along the yt direction uh, we will command a, a contact force if we want to apply a force for some technological reason, for instance for removing extra material from uh, this surface, so the debarring uh, task, uh, but we cannot move, in fact, along the yt direction. So uh, Vx uh, in frame t desired, the scalar, will be the reference for the feedback control law, uh, and um, a force uh, 
along the normal direction, so Fy desired in task frame T, again M minus K, in this case again a scalar, will be uh, the reference for the feedback uh, control loop on force. Now, uh, the sensor frame here uh, has been moved from the sensor, uh, exactly for the reason that I just mentioned, um, is um, uh, measuring um, the two linear forces, Fx and Fy, in fact, uh, in, uh, rotated with respect to what we expect. So even if everything is ideal, and we are experiencing only a force along the yt direction, the sensor will produce measurement both in the ye and xe direction, in fact, the direction uh, of its own reference frame. Uh, similarly, when we are computing velocities, uh, in particular we are computing velocity of the, our, at the contact point, so along the xt and yt direction, and we are doing this by using the encoders, and the differential uh, kinematics, so the Jacobians, and the joint velocities, of course. Uh, but when we compute j of q times q dot, and we have uh, the linear velocity, in this case, we will use a 2 by 2 analytic Jacobian, if we wish. So, uh, these velocities are, in fact, expressed in frame 0. So there's a base frame where we uh, express velocities. So again, even if we are going in the right direction along the tangent, so along xt, indeed we will see component of velocity along x0 and y0 uh, in both directions. So in order to understand if we are doing things correctly, so to generate an error and to react to this error, we should really move these quantities of the force or motion type uh, all in the same frame. So we should in fact rotate and generate error uh, in the same reference frame, which is, in fact, the task frame. So, uh, this will be clear when we um, associate um, a block diagram to our uh, generalized um, uh, hybrid force motion control. So, this is a very important thing. Please uh, understand it correctly. Otherwise, you would select quantities which are correct and you expect that they are, in fact, uh, you, you believe that they are in fact wrong. So, uh, now to the general parameterization of the hybrid task. Uh, we need, um, I mean, through the task frame, and in fact we are describing implicitly uh, the type of contact, so the feasible motion, and this will be parameterized by uh, a set of variables which we collect in S, in fact, S dot will be, in fact, the parameterization of uh, the speed. Uh, in general, both the T matrix and the Y matrix will be function of this parameter, which is associated to the progress of, uh, of the task. Uh, the, as we have seen, in some cases, uh, T and Y will be constant, so there's no parameter, but this is the more general format. So we will have K parameters for describing the admissible free motion, uh, the feasible free motion, and uh, accordingly a set of m minus k parameters, which we call, not by chance, lambda, because they are associated to the parameterization of reaction forces and torques at the contact. So any uh, generalized twist, v omega, of the end effector can be described by a number of k parameter s and with s dot and the matrix t. And similarly, any wrench reaction fm can be described by uh, a set of m minus k parameter lambda through the matrix y. And because reaction forces and torques do not perform work on displacement, so linear and angular displacement of the end effector, uh, the condition is that t transpose y is equal to zero, so that uh, t and y, the columns in this uh, two matrices, t and y, are orthogonal to each other. Not orthogonal inside them, but orthogonal to each other. Okay, 
so this is the starting point. Indeed, uh, in the previous example, and more in general, we will have m equals 6, so the task will be defined in the full uh, three-dimensional space, Cartesian space. In the previous example where we have introduced for uh, as a, an exemplification uh, the frames of interest in this uh, hybrid control problem, uh, we have used m equal to, but in general m is equal to 6. And later on we will assume that the robot has at least or exactly n equals 6 degrees of freedom in order to do computation. Of course, if the robot is redundant, all the things that we know about redundancy can be applied as well. But don't anticipate uh, things at this stage. Uh, so we add to this what? Indeed, we need the robot dynamics. Which dynamics? The one which included uh, generalized forces or wrenches in, in, the, uh, in our formulas. Uh, apply to the end effect. So on the right hand side of the Euler-Lagrange equation we will have the command U generated by the motor torques and then J, J transpose the Jacobian, the geometric Jacobian in this case, multiplying a generic range. Now this is true even if we are not in contact, we are pushing uh, the end effector with forces and uh, torques but indeed, when we will be in contact, f and m uh, should be parameterized by y of s lambda. And so we should substitute this inside this equation. So robot dynamics is important, but also robot kinematics. So, uh, kinematics. so not surprisingly, v and omega uh, are the linear and angular velocity of the end effector with the geometric Jacobian j of q multiplied by q dot. So with Q dot, in general, we may generate uh, a, a twist in any direction, six-dimensional direction. But indeed, when we are in contact, then V and omega cannot be arbitrary, but should be parameterized by the previous formula T of S times S dot. So we should replace this into this equation. And this will be used for making the full derivation. Now, uh, what is our with this parameterization in mind, what is our control hybrid force velocity control objective? I'm using now velocity because instead of motion, because uh, as we have seen, orthogonality is in terms of velocity and reaction forces. But indeed, um, you can use both terminology as well. So uh, the control objective. It's hybrid, so we would like to impose uh, some uh, desired evolution on time uh, to the parameter S, which parameterized with S dot the feasible uh, velocities, so feasible motion. Uh, but at the same time, we would like to assign uh, a value to the parameters lambda, which uh, parameterize forces, and again, this could be any trajectory over time. So this is our task, to bring S to the visa or to keep or bring if we have a reaction or if we have errors on these quantities, uh, S to C, uh, S desired and lambda to lambda desired. And the transient of error should be um, the nicest possible. No? If we are able to achieve this by feedback linearization, so the error behaves as uh, linear with linear dynamics and the convergence. Uh, would be uh, specified, uh, would be exponentially and not just asymptotic. We have already uh, in our background this type of concept, so I will not uh, insist on that. Now, uh, in fact, we will design the hybrid force velocity control using feedback linearization. So, again, in two steps. The first one will linearize and decouple exactly the behavior, but now in a different frame, not in the joint space, not in the Cartesian space, but in the task space, so in the space where we have put the task frame. So we'll use nonlinear feedback in order to do this, and the closed loop model will be exactly the one described in the yellow box. So the acceleration of the parameter S will be uh, specified by a new input A of S, 
and the value of the parameter, par parameters lambda that specify the contact forces will be uh, assigned by another new input A of lambda. Now, once we have obtained this, and we will see how to do this uh, uh, in the um, next uh, slide, uh, we will do complete uh, the control design by a linear specification of AS and A lambda, as we have done before, and we will impose a desired dynamic behavior to the, uh, let's say, motion error and to the force error. Let me use this generic terminology. So, uh, in the following, we will make the assumption that M is equal to M, uh, usually 6. As I said, if N is larger than M, we will have redundancy, so we can achieve the hybrid force velocity control task. And, in addition, we should specify joint torques in the null space of the task uh, in order to, let's say, uh, I don't know, avoid obstacle or... Uh, get the best manipulability uh, configuration and so on and so on. Uh, the other assumption that we make is that uh, the Jacobian, the geometric Jacobian is square and it's not singular uh, for the, during the execution of the task. Now, uh, remember that in, in simple cases, uh, as the first example that we have uh, shown, uh, in fact, S dot and lambda this parameter are only uh, are just single components of uh, S dot of the linear or the angular velocity V or omega and uh, lambda are just linear components of the force or of the momentum so you don't need to uh, think of a parameterization which is complex uh, you can use directly these components and uh, accordingly the matrices T and Y will be uh, what has been called in the uh, original liter literally in this, in this, uh, on these topics as selection matrices, in fact, 0, 1 selection matrices. So they are columns taken from the identity 6 by 6 matrix organized probably among uh, those that describe physical motion and those that describe admissible reaction forces. So, uh, how do we design the feedback linearization in the task space? Uh, this is subtle, uh, but then straightforward. First of all, you start from the kinematics, as usual, I would say. So, uh, you, you describe the linear and angular velocity on one side from the robot mode, from the robot side, so using the Jacobian of the robot and its uh, joint velocity q dot. But on the other side, you're describing the same velocity as those that the type of contact uh, allows to exist, so the feasible motion. So they are described by uh, T of S times S dot. Now, suppose that uh, we drop dependence from now on for compactness or recover when we really need it. Now, this is true. So uh, we cannot generate any V omega uh, with the Q dot, in a given configuration Q with a 6x6 six six matrix, which is non-singular. But in fact, uh, we should constrain the motion uh, in such a way that the feasible uh, velocity of the end effector are parameterized by the T matrix times S dot. So if we uh, differentiate over time, we will have a relationship in terms of acceleration, so J Q double dot, I'm dropping dependence now, plus j dot q dot on one side, on the robot side, should be equal on the uh, same quantity described from the interaction uh, type. So t s double dot plus t dot s dot. And from there, in the assum assumption of non-singularity and of a square Jacobian of the robot, we can isolate the acceleration, so j to the minus 1 times t s double dot plus t dot s dot bringing the other term the minus to the other side, so minus j dot p dot. And now this acceleration, uh, no wonder, uh, will be substituted in the model, in the dynamic model. Uh, first of all, in the dynamic model, as I anticipated, uh, the generic range acting on the end effector is substituted by 
only the admissible range due to the contact. So Fm is being parameterized by Ys of lambda. And you can recognize something from the constraint uh, dynamics uh, that we have uh, considered in the geometric case. Uh, there, will, there was a, a constraint Jacobian, in this case would be J transpose times Y. The only thing is that we are parameterizing Y uh, by uh, the S, which describes the progress of the motion of the, interact, uh, sorry, of the interaction task. So uh, now we uh, take Q double dot and we place it uh, uh, where, it's, uh, where it appears in the dynamic model. Uh, and uh, now we can reorganize things. Uh, so we replace this, and we reorganize, in fact, the inertia matrix. Uh, now, when we uh, substitute Q double dot, we will have uh, an acceleration terms in terms of S double dot, so we will have M times J to the minus 1 T. Now I'm reintroducing dependencies for clarity, uh, times S double dot. And then we will have uh, the parameterization of contact forces. So we will put this into this, let's say, hybrid uh, inertia expressed in the task frame. So uh, this will come from the uh, sec uh, from the right hand side of the dynamic model. So J transpose Y brought to the other side is minus J transpose Y times lambda, and then all the other terms. Those coming from the acceleration again so m j to the minus one times t dot s dot minus j dot q dot and then the standard Coriolis and centrifugal term and gravity term from the model and what remains on the right hand side is only the applicable torques so the input torques u at the motor so there's a uh, one basic consideration here that needs some comment this matrix, which I called the uh, inertia matrix in the task space, uh, the hybrid inertia matrix, because you can see that there are uh, inertia quantities on the first set of columns and uh, non-inertial quantities uh, in the second set of columns. However, this 6 by 6 matrix is non-singular under the assumption that we made, so that the geometric Jacobian of the robot is non-singular and that T and Y are orthogonal to each other. Uh, in fact, this matrix is a 6 by 6 matrix in our case and um, um, the columns of this matrix are independent. Uh, you should prove this. In fact, you can um, obtain this matrix and I, I leave you this for, as an exercise but uh, you can obtain this 6x6 uh, six six matrix as the product of a 6x12 matrix which has the first 6 columns as m j to the minus 1 and the second 6 columns as minus j transpose and indeed uh, this 6x12 uh, matrix is full row rank so it has rank 6 multiplied by a 12 by 6 matrix which has the first six rows with the T matrix and a zero and the second six rows with the zero and the Y matrix. Now being T and Y uh, linearly independent, uh, containing linearly independent columns, this 12 by 6 matrix has full column range equal to 6. So you have a product of a 6 times 12 times 12 times 6 matrices. Both matrices have the right full rank, so the resulting 6 by 6 matrix, which is the one in the slide, uh, will be a full rank, so non-singular. And this is very important because we will not invert this, but we will eliminate this from the picture when we design uh, the feedback linearizing control U. In fact, how did you design this? By taking this matrix and multiplying it by new input A of S and A of lambda and cancelling all the rest. So the linearizing and the control law is in fact uh, one 
specified, the one specified here. So the same uh, hybrid inertia matrix in the task space times the new input AS and a, a, a lambda, and then uh, all the remaining terms uh, that are being cancelled. Of course, we need to know uh, uh, the good model, the dynamic model of the system in, the, in this case. And this is the standard assumption that we make for uh, feedback linearization. So the result is what expected, as I said, uh, S double dot will be equal to uh, S, uh, A of S, the new input, and there are K of such uh, equation. And uh, this is a second order differential equation, by the way. While uh, there are M minus K uh, set of equations, which are algebraic equations, you don't see any derivative there, which specify lambda through uh, uh, the new input A of lambda. So if you had taken S and lambda as output of your nonlinear system, and you would have applied the inversion uh, algorithm that we have seen for the Cartesian uh, control in the free space, uh, you would have ended up by taking enough number of derivatives of your output until the input appears. Uh, and in fact, we have now a difference because we have to differentiate the motion output S twice until the U will appear. And in fact, this is what we have seen from the above equation. So this set of output has, uh, each component has a relative degree equal to, we have already introduced this concept. On the other side, if, uh, on the other side, if we take uh, lambda as uh, output, immediately you will find uh, uh, that you acting on it. Uh, you cancel all uh, nonlinearity and you obtain lambda equal A of lambda. So, uh, Lambda, as an output, has a relative degree zero because you don't have to take any derivative of lambda. This is good because taking derivative of lambda means in a, in a somehow uh, taking derivative of the measured force and the force to sensor uh, is relatively noisy, so you like to avoid taking derivative of force. But this is not needed under our assumption. So, uh, now that you have a linearized and decoupled the system, you, as usual, you apply uh, linear control techniques in order to uh, stabilize the tracking error. I'm talking about tracking error, but of course, you could have regulation tasks where uh, S desired and lambda desired uh, remain constant. But you will do this on each uh, uh, decoupled input-output channel. So for the motion channel, uh, we will uh, use uh, AS as the desired acceleration of the parameter S plus a PD law, and KP and KD will be chosen positive, definite, and diagonal as usual, so that the error uh, defined as SD minus S will satisfy this uh, linear and decoupled differential equation, second order differential equation, which will uh, let any error in S and in S dot converge exponentially to zero. Uh, same story for the uh, algebraic loop. And we will choose this, uh, deserves some comment, uh, this uh, control loop as the desired uh, parameter lambda, lambda desired, which specified in fact the contact forces and moments plus an integral terms on the error between lambda desired and the actual lambda. Uh, why we are doing this? In fact, uh, this uh, implies that the error uh, defined as the difference between lambda d and lambda goes to zero as long as ki is positive. We will again choose ki as a diagonal matrix so that we keep the decoupling. Uh, but uh, why did we this, uh, add this integral term? In fact, since uh, the relation lambda equal A of lambda is algebraic, we could have chosen simply A of lambda equal to lambda desired, and this would be enough. But in this way, uh, we would have introduced, uh, let's say, um, no force error in the control loop, although we were controlling explicitly forces. So adding this integral term does not destroy uh, 
instability. In fact, uh, this is shown by the linear analysis, very simple analysis uh, of these two formulas, uh, but will give more robustness in the presence of constant disturbances that are not being considered. For instance, if you have uh, a longer uh, um, contact direction, a force uh, related to, uh, uh, to friction or to uh, an un uncorrect orientation of the surface, then you will keep, uh, you, this will act typically as a constant disturbance and this will be rejected by the integrator. So it's very convenient to use this. On the other side, you don't put derivative on this because derivative of uh, the error uh, lambda would involve lambda dot and therefore some derivative of the measured forces which we would like to avoid. Uh, this is about all we need, but if we look at this equation, uh, we should understand how to realize those control loop and in fact how to get information on s, s dot and lambda which appear in the yellow and in the green box. Indeed the desired values have been chosen by the uh, artificial constraints or by uh, our way of executing the task but then in order to close error loops we need actual measure. So we need uh, to extract uh, s, s dot and lambda from the actual measurement available on our system. Uh, which are these measurements? Indeed, we can measure, we assume that we measure uh, the configuration Q by encoders. We can assume that we measure, although there's no uh, direct sensor for that, also Q dot by a numerical differentiation of the very accurate encoders. And we have also four star sensor mounted in the effect. So from these quantities, we should extract the actual value of s, s dot, and lambda. And by doing this, uh, we will also filter out all the components that are non-consistent with uh, the geometric model, uh, the idle model of the interaction. Uh, how do we do this? So first of all, s and s dot will be obtained uh, from measure of Q and Q dot. And as we say, as we have seen for the design of the controller itself, we will equate uh, the, the pose and also the uh, generalized velocity from the robot side, so described by the direct kinematics and by the differential kinematics with the Jacobian, with the same description from the environment side, which is a function of S and S dot. So S indeed for the uh, uh, pose and s dot for the velocities. Uh, it's difficult to make a, a, a general treatment at this stage, but I, I will show this through a, a simple example, exactly the robot turning the crank. So uh, where is the end effect of position? Uh, this is described from the robot side by the vector r with respect to frame 0. Now the frame 0 has been placed in this point, but it's irrelevant just not to design the robot itself. Uh, so uh, from one side, uh, from the robot side, there will be some kinematics f of 0 of q. Uh, however, from the interaction side, uh, this is parameterized by s. In fact, if the crank co uh, if the crank has a, 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 a length L, uh, the actual position of the end effector is L cosine of, sine, uh, of S and L sine of S and a zero because you're working in uh, the plane X zero, Y zero. In any case, it's constant while you're rotating the crank. So from here, uh, from the measurement of Q, and from the value of the direct kinematics, of f of q expressed in frame 0, so these are numbers at this point, you can extract the value of s by doing an arc tangent of f of y and f of x expressed uh, in frame 0. A very simple example, but this is the general procedure that you would apply, and of course, case by case, robot by robot, you will have this type of extraction. What about 
S dot, this is more simple once you have S, so you equate the uh, linear velocity from the robot side and from the uh, robot environment interaction side, uh, this equation was already found before, remember that, uh, suppose that the robot has, uh, as, a, as we have considered so far, uh, six degrees of freedom, and uh, the task is six-dimensional, in fact. So you have a six-by-six six Jacobian, which is invertible. Uh, although you don't need this at this stage. On the other side, T is uh, a six-by-K, with K less than six um, matrix. So if you want to isolate S dot, you need to do an pseudo inverse of T, so you will have T pseudo inverse times J P dot. I will come back to this in a moment. Uh, so now that you have S and S dot, uh, what about lambda? Well, lambda is related to contact forces, so we will use the force torque measures uh, from the force torque sensor at the end effector. And again, uh, we will use the basic relation of the parameterization of these forces. So we assume that anything that you measure, and this is in Fm, uh, should be described by y times lambda. Now let me comment on this immediately. Indeed, you may at some point have measurements that are not in the span, so in the range of the matrix y. So could not be captured by uh, a lambda. So if you solve for lambda in this way, so making the pseudo inverse of this matrix y, which is again non-square, so it's a six by six minus k column, six rows and six minus k column. So uh, you do the pseudo inverse. In this case, you will minimize the error you know, on uh, what you measure and on what you can express through your modeling stage. So every time, for instance, you have an uncertainty, uh, you can measure forces that are not in the span, but you extract in a consistent way lambda by doing this pseudo-inverse. So both pseudo-inverses are uh, of tall matrices. So this is exactly the opposite case of redundancy. No? So we have more rows than columns. And assuming that this T and Y matrices are full rank, the pseudo-inverse can take uh, a closed form. For instance, for the T pseudo-inverse, we will have the T transpose T to the minus 1 T transpose expression. Indeed, we can use singular value decomposition, More in general, we could use also, instead of simple pseudo-inversion for uh, extracting S dot and lambda from this uh, equation, we could use a weighted pseudo-inversion, takes it take into account uncertainty and other uh, aspects. Uh, but this filtering, in any case, is the one that uh, accompanies the uh, implementation of hybrid uh, force motion control. And this is completely absent when we are uh, returned to the original constraint dynamics that we have uh, dealt with. So we are really looking at the practical aspect the non-idealities and the filtering aspect is part of the game. So, uh, let us summarize this in a block diagram and uh, stop here for the moment. So, uh, you can see uh, various blocks with colors. So, I will refer to colors. Uh, you start with the robot which is in contact with the environment. So, your inputs are you and uh, your out, I mean, of course, uh, you measure Q, you measure Q dot, or please, uh, indirectly through numerical differentiation of Q, and you measure F and M with the force torque sensor mounted on the end effect. Now, however, these are not the quantities that you're interested to. Because of our parameterization, our output are in fact lambda and S. So the one that uh, are outside the filtering of measurement. So, the open loop system goes from, let's say, the six torques U uh, generated by the motors to the six quantities, in fact, M equals six in general, uh, um, 
6 minus k will be lambda and k will be s. So, same number of input and same number of output, but in fact, this model is highly nonlinear because of the nonlinearity of the robot and because of the nonlinearity of the uh, environment uh, model, the way in which it uh, constrains the end effector and generates contact forces, uh, and also coupled. So, if you move one of the joint torques, you will affect, um, in general, all lambda and all s. So, what you do is you apply the task space uh, feedback linearization that we have seen before. This is the first step of our control law, of our hybrid control design. So now, between the new input AS and A lambda in front of the yellow box, and the uh, output S and uh, lambda out of the light green or olive green block, we will have linearization and decoupling. In particular, uh, double change of integrator on each component between uh, each component of AS and each component of S, and an algebraic relation between each component of A lambda and uh, each component of the output lambda. Okay? Now, uh, the remaining part of the block, so the blue and the violet lines and the gains KP, KD, and KI, are in fact. Uh, the linear design. No? So, for instance, for the M minus K force control loops with a diagonal and positive KI, uh, we are generating A lambda with the desired component lambda desired of the parameterization of forces and uh, torques at the contact, plus uh, the integration of the error between lambda D and lambda. And this is represented by the violet loops, and there will be m minus k force loop in general, m equals 6 is the standard case. Uh, on the other side, uh, we will have uh, for the um, motion input AS, this will be generated by the desired acceleration of the parameters that, um, that um, are describe the feasible motion. And then with the KP of the error SD minus S and the derivative term KD of the uh, first derivative term SD dot minus S dot. Indeed, I have separated this, so I have the blocks on the feedback loop and I have a combined feed forward terms. But if you recombine these things, you have exactly desired acceleration plus PD of the error. Uh, now, this block diagram is quite general, huh? quite general, because there are limit cases. For instance, if k is equal to m, or 6, then there will be no force control loop. There will be only motion involved, and this is just the parameterization of the free motion. So this type of uh, control, or block diagram applies, for instance, to Cartesian space feedback linearization. So the task frame will be the natural frame uh, associated to the end effector, no need to specify it, and along each direction you will impose in a decoupled and linear way the desired motion. So the limit case when k is equal to m are free motion and the control that we have seen in the Cartesian space. There's another limit case, which is probably less relevant, is it when k is equal to zero. So there will be no motion control loops, and there will be m linear and decoupled force control loop design on the linear side of this task. Now, what does it mean? We are only controlling forces. That means that the robot and effector cannot go anywhere. It's like frozen in the concrete, so we cannot move, and so there makes no sense to assign a motion to the end effector, but indeed, uh, using the torques uh, produced by the motors at the joints, we can regulate or assign any time profile to the contact forces and momentums uh, acting on the end effector, because this end effector is fully constrained by the environment. As I said, like if you're uh, putting a solid block of concrete uh, around the end effector, and indeed, the robot will not move. 
if the robot has extra degrees of freedom, it can reconfigure its uh, configuration, but indeed not move the end effect. So this limit case is of little relevance, but shows that we can have a full range of possibility by moving k from 0 to m. And when it's positive and strictly less than m, let's say 6 in the general case, then we will have really a hybrid control problem. And this way of approaching things is a very successful one. Let's uh, make a break and we will continue uh, uh, considering the special case of selection matrices. So when the uh, T and Y matrices included in the task space feedback analyzation and in the filtering of measures are simply column of the selection matrix or columns of the 0, 1, uh, 6 by 6 identity matrix. Thank you for listening.